Is that right, Maya? Are we, are we, are we, uh, yes, we are unmuted is, now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're good to go. Okay. All right, good. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jack Kittredge. Um, with my wife, Julie Rawson, we own Many Hands Organic Farm here in Barrie, Massachusetts. Uh, we've been here, uh, we bought the land 40 years ago. We've been here about 38, 39 years. Um, and we've done a lot of, <clears throat> I was particularly fond of fruit. So when we bought the land before we even moved here, we began putting in fruit trees. Uh, and now we have about 100 fruit trees, so many of which are producing very well. And we also did a lot of small fruit, with the berries and <clears throat> grapes and things like that. And uh, since the management of those is somewhat different, we did a previous workshop on the orchard fruit, and now we're going to be talking about the small fruit. Uh, I think that the, um, the numbers are not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> um, the numbers are uh, small mm -hmm. enough, and who's going to be here? That I think if you have a question about take your point being made, uh, you can hang out either at the table or on Zoom. You can probably deal with it while that slide is up or while we're talking about it. Uh, if this gets burdensome, we'll, we'll change that, but I think it's, it's reasonable to do. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you certainly can, can remember your point or write it down or something, and we'll, we'll try to uh, have a Q&A afterwards. <clears throat> um, is that your plan? After you go out and come back, or you want to do Q&A? Oh, I, I didn't hear that. We can Probably do we can do the Q&A before, before we go. Before. Yeah, there will be a, a, an expedition for the people who are here out actually to do mm -hmm. hands on a little bit on the, on the small fruit. Um, and we're not in a position to, to uh, broadcast that. Um, we're determined on Zoom. But uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll get enough on the, on the PowerPoints and the discussion here to be helpful to you. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to be talking about grapes because they are a special case of small fruit. And um, I think we want to back up one. There we go. Um, the important thing is to think about grapes is that they are a vining fruit, that is, they produce on a vine rather than a trunk or a, or a, or a stem or something like that. And that is, I guess you could say, uh, a trick by, you know, nature, nature's full organisms a trick and, and are parasitic in some way on other living organisms. And grapes, in fact, are you might say parasitic on things that have trunks and um, they evolve depending on other things to get them up in the air. And that's a good strategy if you're around trees or tall things. It's a terrible strategy if you don't have something tall to climb on and you're probably gonna die out in that area. So as so much happens in nature that things, you know, it depends on where you are and what's going on around you. But in an area like New England, where we got lots of small, uh, lots of trunks and trees, Grapes do very well, um, and uh, <clears throat> they, uh, by saving the energy that would be necessary to produce a chunk, they put that energy into their their vines and their fruit. And so I think, uh, in terms of overall production, if you're looking at biomass or something, how much of the biomass of a particular plant is fruit, grapes are right at the top. And um, you know, obviously, if you like the flavor, if you like what you can do with them, that's even better. Um, most people uh, are successful here with uh, American grapes. They're usually country kind of varieties. Um, I've made one, so plenty of wine with, with American grapes. You just have to add some sort of sugar. I use honey. Um, but if you're interested in making wine, you can also try European grapes, wine grapes. And they're much harder to grow in, in uh, the Northeast and much more fussy. So unless you really want to put some serious time and energy into it, I wouldn't recommend growing <coughs> wine grapes. But conquer grapes are practically indestructible here and do very well. Okay, made the point about they need trees or they need something up to, to get up in, into the air. Um, basically, here's the way grapes grow in nature. They they grow, you know, you see, probably seen places like this where they're many many vines coming down from trees and the many many vines going up from trees and basically that vine is rooted in the soil in several places and, and that's how it's feeding itself but it is climbing the tree getting going through that dense mass of shade 
to get to the top of the tree where in fact there is sunlight. And that's what you really need to think about is that the grapes will be produced where there's sunlight. That's how really all fruit works. If you don't have sunlight, you're not going to get much fruit. Um, and therefore, think about what you would do if you had, you know, to climb a three foot tree, maybe more, to get to where you could produce your fruit. Um, you know, <clears throat> basically, here's, oops, sorry. Okay, just, there we go. Um, okay, we go to the next one. Um, basically, because they can't move around their, their plants, um, um, they have come to live and thrive in an area where new growth each year, if they put it out near the near the roots, near the near the trunk, as most plants would do, uh, it's going to be coming out in shade, and so it's got to adapt to that. And it has adapted to that, has evolved growth patterns that are totally, totally different. And the new growth has to occur basically at the ends of the vine, where it can get sunlight generally, and um, it can detect sunlight, and so you will get some new buds in the sunlight if it happens, if, if uh, trees next, next door to it come down and all of a sudden sunlight is exposed on that vine, you may get some new buds there. But by and large, the new buds are gonna be produced at the end of the plant because that's where the, the grape expects the sunlight to be. So that basically is, is the key thing you have to think about when you're dealing with grapes. Uh, okay, uh, like I said, there's one exception where uh, if, if a tree falls or exposes, you know, uh, somehow the, the grape is exposed to, to sudden sunlight, you some, sometimes can grow new buds in, in that sunlight. It'll detect that heat and that energy coming from the sun and sometimes put out, put out some buds there, but uh, generally you don't want to count on that. Okay. So basically the lesson from all that talk is that buds are almost always at the ends of the vines. Uh, here's, a, here's a graphic you want to look at for a minute of study. This is a bearing habit of a grape. And at the, old, at the very left, you'll see the old wood. That's, that could be you know, three years old. It could be 50 years old, whatever. It's, it's the coming from the root um, up and supporting to the extent that grapes do any supporting at all the, uh, the, the, the plant. And from that old wood comes growing shoots, which in turn will become old wood, if, depending on how you prune them. Uh, but this year they are uh, the end in one year old canes, which is where the fruit is produced. They're produced at the base base of one year old canes. So um, you can see that the, the, uh, the first original uh, vertical there on the left, the old wood, and the horizontal there are the growing, uh, or the, is, is the one year old cane. And the thing coming up that has leaves on it or grapes on it, one coming up, one coming down, those are growing shoots that they grew this year. And they are the ones that produce the, the, uh, the, the grapes and the fruit. Okay, it's important to, under, to kind of gather that, that that one year old cane is the only thing that really is going to produce you that fruit. And that fruit is not going to come on the cane itself, but on new. Shoots, you call them zero year old canes if you want or something. This year, canes, that's where you're going to get the fruit. And that's what you want to think about when you're pruning for, uh, for production. Um, so basically, I, I just kind of reiterates those points. Uh, old grape, any but the <coughs> one year old uh, wood is useless for production. Obviously, it's necessary for you know the structure and reaching those one year old canes, but you want that, that old wood to be as short as possible so that the canes for producing the fruit are as close as possible to the roots so that energy doesn't have to travel, you know, 30 feet, sap and so forth to, just to, to reach the fruit. Um, so your, your job basically in pruning um, is, you know, in a lot of pruning, the rules are, you know, take out the dead stuff, take out the stuff that's, you know, crossing, take out the disease stuff, open up the plant. Those are good rules. And they're not, they're good rules for grapes too, but probably even more important in superseding them all is you want to find productive canes that is um, um, 
ones that are going to be producing grapes, which are near to the roots. And it's going to be a little bit hard, hard for you to do that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I, I, I think that hitting this point too heavily, but the grape puts the group down at the last case where the sunlight is your system, whatever it is, you can be a trellis or a fence or lots of ways you can grow grapes. But um, most people's system does not have 40 foot, 30 foot poles for producing grapes. They've got something right handy. And that means you're going to be fighting that tendency of the grape to put long vines out there and put grapes at the end because you want those grapes that close where they're going to be right easy for you. Um, so you have to override that plant tendency there. And um, hopefully I can show you this in a, in a <clears throat> okay, here's a uh, three stage illustration if you want. On the left basically is an old vine. That's what you will find if you go out now to a, to a productive grapevine that was produced last year, it will have grown something like that. Um, the middle stage is what you will achieve after the first step in your pruning you see those little red flags there in the middle step in lots of places on the grapevine. Those are places you have identified as places you want to cut and prune, but you haven't yet made the actual pruning cuts because you want to be sure that you're doing the right thing. So you flag them all. And then the first stage is, you know, it's what you're going to end up with when you've made the proper, the proper cuts and cut it all those places. Is that pretty, pretty clear what's going on here? Okay. Um, this is the different system for training grapes, which I think I prefer is most productive and easy to manage. There are lots of them. Um, the next four slides are all going to be the top picture of grapes, and then a picture below that, which is we've taken one step. So, in the next one, we'll, we'll, we'll repeat step one, and we'll give you step two as well. And the next one, we'll repeat step two, and give you three. So, so if you're reading a lot of things, it sounds the same. Well, all these are duplicated, but hopefully you get the, the idea of each of these steps. First off, you've got the unpruned grapevine. And the second step is you can see again those flags or ribbons where the, the, the places where custom we made have been flagged. Okay, that's step one is to do the flagging. Okay, step one is done now up above. And step two is to select for what we call renewal spurs. Um, and they are going to be the ones that will not produce fruit this year, but will produce fruit next year. And the reason you want to produce those and select them and flag them and protect them and be sure you have them is if you come back in a year and you don't have any of those, your whole process is, is you've got some good fruit from this year, but you, you got nothing that's going to produce fruit close to the roots next year. So you need to be thinking always a year ahead when you're pruning. Um, and uh, I hope they're, they're basically the same things as the, the, the uh, buds that you're going to be cutting for production this year. They're all this year's production, but some of them are particularly close to the roots and um, are, are, are always those are the ones you want, to, you want to select for saving and flagging and making sure that they survive and thrive because they're going to give you the fruit next year and, you're, and then next year you come back and look for, for new ones that you can save for the year after that and so forth. And that's, that's the key thing that you have to do with grapes that you don't have to do with normal, normal fruiting things because of this whole process that otherwise you can, you can prune and you'll get productive buds, but they may be 30 feet out along that wire. This different system, if you can't see it, is two wires. The first one about three feet up above the ground, going horizontally, maybe two and a half feet or something. The second was maybe more like four or five feet. And you will prune the grapes to those wires. So you have four arms, two, one going left, one going right low, and one going left, one going right higher. And so you get four arms of production and that spreads the grape out to the sunlight. Uh, it's a good system. It's, it's at the height that you can easily pick, um, just easy to manage. So. Uh, I would suggest that if you have an arbor, we also have an arbor that's very fun to see and it's fun to pick in and so forth, but I don't think it's as productive. 
so it depends on what your, your choices are. If you, you know, you want you more architecturally integrate grapes into your house, great, find ways to get them up and into the sun. We also do grapes on both of our retaining walls here. Um, and that's a great way to do it because they're south facing and they're, you know, any, any place you've got a, a vertical system that you can attach grapes to and it faces south or faces the sun. We have one over here too, right? Right outside. Yeah, the outside the window there, you see the like grapes the, hanging down there. Grapes but, actually destroyed <laughs> that whole window. We have to put a new one in. But, uh, you know, it, it's crazy <laughs> not to use those for, for something instead of everything that you know, that you paid in a nursery for. Your grapes, if you paid in a nursery for it, just don't need that to deal. Jack, but Jack, the uh, the renewal buds are on the floor that you cut. I'm sure the renewal buds are on the floor that you cut from above there. No. Are they in the floor that you cut that you left? Um, no, the renewal buds are separate from the four fruiting canes. So we, you're really identifying eight uh, ways in which life is leaving the stem and going out. And four of those you're going to make fruiting canes this year and get fruit from. And four you're going to preserve. You're going to make much shorter and make all the energy stay there. But there will be some buds that can support that life. And these, those will be your fruiting canes next year. And you'll have new buds coming back that you can identify four of for renewal spurs. Is that any clear, Phil? Good. Yeah, this is this is the key, key guts to it. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that. All right, now we've done, we've selected the renewal spurs as well. Now we cut um, the back renewal spurs very close, <coughs> very tight there, cut. So we have a quarter or two left. And ideally, they will be located close to the four wires, you know, the <coughs> upper left and right and the lower left and right, so that next year the vines that come from them can be moved slightly and lifted and not broken and trained to those wires. And that's so when you select those renewal spurs, besides being close to the vine, you want to also make them close to the wires if you can. That's ideal. It's usually easy to find ones for the upper ones because those are in the sunlight. We've got lots of buds. The ones down below have been shaded out by the upper buds leaves this year, last year, whatever, the fruiting year. And so the new ones don't have as many buds, but ideally you can do that. So stage four now has the re renewal spurs have been cut first. And uh, you can go back for just for a second. Uh, the new renewal spurs have been cut up above, as you can see, um, hopefully back to one bud. And, but you still have the other fruit, uh, fruiting canes, and also all the, ex all the ex extra stuff that it, it is going to be in your way. And so stage between stage two and three is You've cut the, cut the renewal spurs. Now you cut away all the other stuff except for the fruiting canes. And that's the big one that where you see you know, all that tangle of stuff. And it, it is an incredible tangle when you get out there and see it. Um, it's, it's now cut back very close to the, to the trunk. Uh, you don't want buds coming from any of those places because they just give you extra stuff to, to, to produce. And then you have what we have labeled as step three here, just the fruiting canes, long fruiting canes left. And then we go to the next slide. And in the bottom, you can see the fruiting canes themselves have now been cut short, but not all the way to the trunk where you won't get any fruit. So they have maybe 10 buds a piece or something like that. Um, what I, we have, you know, those fences, we have maybe six or seven grapes planted every eight feet along those fences. And I just let each one go four feet to halfway to the next grape, and the other grape will come four feet towards it. So I'm using all the wire. Whatever system you can, it'll be easy for you. Uh, but make sure you have fruiting, you have buds on those fruiting canes because those are the things that are going to produce the new shoots. If you remember back at the earlier illustration, the new shoots that actually produce the grapes, the fruiting stuff. So that's basically the process. Anybody got questions? Sure. So basically, along with your fruiting sheet, your sheet, your pruning shears, buy yourself a couple of colors of of uh, tagging ribbon at a hardware store. They've got you know any, any color you want, and you want. To, I use two colors because I use one to mark my fruiting canes, and I use a different color to mark my renewal canes. So that when I'm coming back, 
and it's just this tangle of vines everywhere and ribbons now too. I know what I've thought through before. I don't have to rethink it through. And I say, okay, this is a original thing. It's yellow. You know, put this real close. This is a fruiting thing because it's red. So I'll give this one, you know, 10 bucks or something. Um, so, uh, how do you identify a fruiting cane? When you're actually in this situation, it, one, the one mistake you can easily make is to think a, a living cane is dead and cut it off, or think a dead cane is living and think it's going to produce fruit, and you do all this work to it and it doesn't produce any fruit. So you need to identify the live living canes um, in this whole process of picking, identifying the eight that you're going to mark. Um, and there's no beating experience, you know, um, that's how you're really going to learn. I can't you know, listen to a lot of talks, but until you're out there doing it, you say, oh my God, I made a mistake. Yeah, that's how you learn. Um, if you snip off a fruiting cane and it's the last fruiting cane on that plant, and sometimes I've done that, um, the plant basically is dead unless you luck out and um, maybe get some new buds next year, which, you know, it's not likely to happen. <clears throat> um, it's just this huge mass of vines, but all that wood is not, there's none of that left this first year wood. And so you're not going to get any buds for next year. And so <clears throat> you've, you've killed that plant. Uh, how do you distinguish first year wood from older wood? First year, it's very clear if you look at the wood. The first year wood is smooth, has a smooth bark. Uh, older bark, older wood has that curling paperish bark that if you've seen grapes, you know, it's, it's coming off, it's, you know, it's sloughing. Um, <clears throat> sloughing. sloughing, I guess, yeah, you, it, it's like somebody wrapped it very loosely and poorly and then got out in the rain and it went well coming off. But um, this first year wood is very smooth and, and it's like you would expect on those plants. And, and the older wood is, is obviously grapeish kind of wood that's old and everything. when you go out and look at the stuff, you're going to see the, the older wood. Um, and if you actually want to know in a particular cane how how much of it is alive, um, you can carefully test it. You snip off the very end bud. Uh, if there's no green there beneath that, that whole vine all the way back to the trunk is dead. Um, if there is green, there should be a thin ring of cambium. Are you familiar, you guys familiar with cambium? It's, it's a little paper thin living part of bark, it's under the first layer of bark, <coughs> which is protective, then there's this cambium where all the life blood and sap flows in the plant. And then there's wood inside that basically is dead. If you see that greenish, <coughs> that means that you've got life out there to that point. Um, if you cut back far enough, you think it would get greener and greener and greener because you're getting closer to the trunk, but not so. If you get back, if, if that is a, uh, fruiting cane, it came off a one year cane. And if you can identify that junction point and you cut all the way back to the one year cane, now your buds are going to not have that cane, but it's going to be dead. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that in doing this test, you clearly identify where that living cane is coming off the one year old wood and <coughs> make sure you don't um, cut back to that. Um, so that, that's the best test I know. You just, you know, cut it very carefully and uh, see if you see that, that living green stuff. It'll be pretty obvious. Um, okay, that's basically the, the, uh, the grape lesson. Um, anybody have any questions on any of this stuff? People on Zoom, too. Yeah, people on Zoom, any questions? Yeah, people on there, it's like that. I don't see anything in the chat, but. Somebody saying something? She said no. she didn't see anything. In the chat. Oh, okay. That was true. Wow. He either bored him to death or they cleared it out. It's like, oh my God, that's too complicated for me. It's clear. Is Mike said it's clear. Okay. Oh. Well, then. Hi, Mike. <laughs> oh, I'm Mike and Becky. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a question. When the grapes grow on the trees, which is not happening here, does it? I'm do, sorry, what? Do the grapes do damage to the trees when they're? They can ultimately, they can strangle the tree. I mean, they can so block the sunlight that the tree is, yeah, we have some like trees that are killed. There's wild. <clears throat> uh, I, I tend to go around and when the grapes up there, 
that much kind of harvest those grapes, so I just kind of killed them and basically I cut them off. One thing about a grape is that um, <clears throat> another thing, part of its design is that if if you cut a grape off, you know, six feet up or something from the ground, it's going to fall down that six feet and it's going to sprout new roots. And you really have to cut it off at the ground uh, because that's the way grapes produce themselves. Eventually they strangle the tree, the tree dies, it falls down, and the grape then has to sprout new roots and, you know, proceed to continue to live. So it's designed by nature. But, uh, sorry about that. Uh, to to do that and, and you can use that to your advantage if you you know got a grape you like and it's very productive don't buy another one for 30 bucks or whatever it costs at the, at the you know the uh, nursery take a uh, section take a long vine this, in this case you're taking a ninth vine not ones you're using for fruiting or for renewal but a ninth kind of vine take this sticky log take it from where it's coming up lay it down carefully so you don't break it uh, and big, dig a little trench two inches deep or something in the ground, lay a couple feet of the grape vine in that trench, cover it with dirt, come back in a year, and you'll have a new grape. You know, cut it off at that point after a year, and you've got these roots to carefully dig it up, put it through your fence or wherever you want to plant it, and you'll have a grape. I've done that plenty of times. It's very, very easy to transplant because of that system. Um, Jack, uh, what time of year should, should you be doing pruning? I mean, right now? Yeah, when I, uh, and partly because of my job and stuff, it, I, March 1st was when I started doing pruning generally, and grapes I tended to do at the end after we done the trees. Uh, so that would be more like now or even in the you know, beginning of April. <clears throat> when you start seeing sap dripping after you've made a cut, you should, you're a little bit late. <laughs> make, make a note of your calendar to be earlier next year because you don't want to let sap energy basic carbohydrates and stuff that have been produced by the by the bees mm -hmm. being wasted. But <clears throat> it, it'll be a while before it, I mean, that would be ideal, I think, in the next couple of weeks. Other questions? I asked him. Oh, I think that's just the mouse. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, I guess we're on with Julie. All right. Let's see that this way. No. That way. Okay, so we raise a lot of small fruit here. Actually, we kind of when we got here it was like, well, we like to have one at least one of everything. <laughs> so we do have a rhodia, which will be reminding to show you when we're up there. We also have some sea berries up there. Is that what those are called? Sea, sea berries? Is that what you planted up there? Um, we got sea berries. We got all kinds of berries. Yeah. Something up there, but um, <laughs> berries, but we that. also um, enjoy mm -hmm. our our gooseberries to some extent. Our elderberries. Um, we have the aronia is a little bit challenging. It doesn't taste that great. So I have to find ways to mask it in other fruits. But um, we also are going to talk today about red raspberries, black raspberries, blackberries. Uh, we'll take a look at the elderberries if we have time. We'll look a little bit at our strawberries and blueberries. And there's probably something else that we get to. But anyway, here's a, here's a picture of black raspberries. And when we're done here, we're going to go out and spend about 15 minutes each with, um, we're going to look, first look at the strawberries and the red raspberries and the black raspberries and the blueberries and then the grapes. So we're going to do five things when we, when we go out. Um, this, I was trying to show you, I took this picture yesterday of a, a black raspberry. Um, they are uh, propagate by tip layering, and it's kind of like what Jack was talking about with the grapes. But they, on their own, they're gonna they just go kind of come zoom down from where they are. And they put out usually like three fingers, and then they plant themselves in the soil. And you can let them, um, you know, actually once they're once they're rooted, you can either pull that up gently or dig it up, and you can chop it off at the somewhere in the elbow here. And, and you have a new plant. So that's how black raspberries like to like to grow. <clears throat> um, we prune out the dead wood wood and um, the bearing oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, the bearing came from the previous year. <clears throat> um, and then we uh, we're good to go for the next year. So um, and in order to the trouble I think with, <clears throat> with raspberries and anything that's thorny is that it's um, so unpleasant to be in the presence of. 
And so we, uh, an old friend of ours, an old Italian uh, friend who knew so much about everything, taught us how to make a trello system, which I'll show you pictures of, but we try to keep our black raspberries, our blackberries, and our red raspberries in these kind of box-like trellises where we put a post, two posts in the ground about 18 uh, inches apart and and then uh, in rows and then put wire around them two or three times. So two, two so is the other end too, so you got a box. Yeah, so that they can stay in there <clears throat> so that you can walk through there and you know not lose your fingers or your clothing or whatever. Um, Blueberries here. I have a note how the chickens have ripped out all the mulch. Um, well, we're going to go out and work on this blueberry later, but um, one of the ways I know that it's really very uh, healthy under the mulch is that the chickens always go for all the berries. And they they just like tons of, of worms and stuff under there. These guys, so they're still they're still free ranging. We have to put them away very soon. Um, but they will do this for all this uh, around the bushes. <laughs> they love going under very bushes because it's great protection for them from hawks and things in the sky. Yeah. And there's all kinds of roots and bugs there. And it's, yeah, we find a favorite place for them. Um, so pruning blueberries as with trees, we kind of think of them more like we would with a tree. Um, we prune out any dead and crossing wood. And um, berries, blueberries produce berries mostly on the second and third year wood with some on the fourth and fifth. But you can tell basically they just as they get older they look a little bit more grody and you know you can take out they say up to a third a third of old wood you can take off every year but you know I don't know really if we do it that way necessarily but um uh and we're basically wanting to open up the bush with some like we have a nice bush over here which we'll and we'll enjoy working with you. Yeah. You have to make some judgments on the micro on that bush. Yeah. 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 Or the fourth and fifth wood, of course. The second, first, and second, and third year wood is coming off a lot, a lot of that stuff. So you can't just take all the fourth and fifth year wood off, or you're also be taking off most of the other stuff. But you kind of make a decision about, you know, this is only got one little piece coming off, and it's like twelve or something. So yeah. So you edited my thing last night, made it better. I put a couple things in up place. There. <laughs> As you know, it's made it better. It was better. It was better. <laughs> Red raspberries and blackberries. Um, that's a little dark here, but um, that we're going to also go over there. And, and this is where I pull out some feed bags and we're going to dig up some berries if you'd like to take some home. These are Latham red raspberries. Blackberries, our blackberries tend to be, they ha we handle them somewhat similar to the red raspberries. These are um, uh, a summer bearer and they're called Latham. I actually got them from my mom in 1984. Who, Rolling back from Illinois in our back, in the back of our uh, station wagon, I think with our four kids in there too. But um, so it's a nice summer bear uh, that comes in in July and August. Uh, there are also red raspberries that are ever bearing, and they, if you prune them down to the ground um, in the fall or early spring, they'll produce for you in September. Uh, we used to we used to have ever bears, but we had so many years where they would freeze off before they made it here for a thousand feet. So it, well, they weren't respond, reliable, but they're awfully good if, if you get them. Um, so a box area I talked to you about, um, they like um, they like to run our underground. So with these plants, they go under and they send out roots and then they send up new shoots. And so they're constantly, um, that's how they propagate, and they're very, very, if they're happy, they're very, very um, prolific, and you can really start a new plantation with them or give them away or whatever, cut them, sell them. Um, we cut out the old canes, and those are the ones that bore last year. So we'll do that, a little bit of the red raspberries, to show how that's done. And the ones that are, yeah, they jump out of the trellis, and then again, with berries, if you don't have a system where it's easy for you to go and pick, I think, especially on the home scale, if it's really unpleasant, uh, people end up not really harvesting all of their berries. So that's why we really like that um, that trellis system where it's going up and then you can go and look around them. Um, <coughs> strawberries, uh, we're just going to show you um, this. This is a picture of our strawberries that was taken yesterday, two days ago. Um, Where's but, the red part? Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're still under their mulch. So what you, strawberries need to be mulched over the winter on top of them so that because they're so shallowly rooted, they're likely to frost heave. Um, and, and if they frost heave, then they, and then it gets really cold again, they'll die. So 
the mulch will help keep that more, uh, the temperature more regulated so that they don't frost heat. And then we come back out in maybe April 15th or so. Um, depends on the, how the weather's looking and pull all those, all that mulch off. How many rows there, Julie? Uh, there are three beds. Um, so you see the, uh, we have a, people have raised beds, we have raised pathways here. <laughs> it was we're constantly going not that, that wasn't totally intentional. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't intentional, but that's what that's the reality. The story and and wood chips has walking paths. Wood chips are the walking paths, and the weeds are on top. Yeah, yeah. So um, weeds are by far the biggest challenge with strawberries. You know, we don't really have a complete handle on that. So we have a lot of volunteers that go out and weed strawberries, but they usually do a shitty job. So we have to go back and do it again anyway. But um, we do plant them in four foot wide beds and most of the pathways with wood chips and cover them, like I said, establishing new beds. Um, we will often, the um, daughter plants are called, well, they, they, strawberries are great. They have, they shoot out this arm and on the end of the arm, there's a new, a new berry plant. Just chop it off, the, chop off the, the shoot. Um, and you have voila new plants. You can start new ones. So we haven't bought new strawberries for quite a while. No, those yeah. beds that you had the photo of, did we start those with purchased plants? I mean, it was probably three or four years ago, but yeah. Uh, any other beds we started from our own plants. Yeah, we actually had them closer to the house before, and one of our staff members wisely pointed out that the reason we were having trouble with our strawberries because the chickens were ripping them out of the ground every spring. So <laughs> they're further out in the field, so we would more, and they're doing much better. Um, fertility and in season management regimen. For all the kinds of blueberries, we lay thick cardboard and cover with wood chips, preferentially. That's wood chips preferentially if we have them. Hay will grow up more bindweed and other kind of grassy weeds and stuff like that. So we really like to use wood chips because um, there's nothing in there that's going to grow. Um, beside, uh, aside, not aside from that, regardless of that, we still have a lot of bindweed, which is our biggest problem in our canes. Bindweed is uh, like, great, like grapes, likes to grow on something. So. Um, they'll wrap themselves around me in. Um, they'll wrap themselves around and strangle your plants. Yeah, so um, I think the best thing that I have found with bindweed is to we'll just go, we crawl around in our raspberries and just try to take them out right at the base of the plant. Um, and do it on a rather regular basis, like once a week, um, in order to keep them at bay, because they've, they've really taken down a lot of our particular our red raspberries. Um, but that's nice if you don't have bindweed. It's a, it's a real problem we have here. Um, yeah, same here. It's, it, it's awful on our farm. Just awful. Yeah. Especially in the fruit, the blueberries, the raspberries. Yeah. Yeah, it's they, really bad in the fruit. It sure is. Um, we did buy a weed racker. We got a guy who was really good at the weed racker last year who actually did an amazing job and finally got it under control uh, um, sometime in, I guess it was August, and we didn't have to worry about it for the rest of the year, but um, that's, a, that's a challenge we have. Um, so I won't, as our plants are basking in ultimate fertility, we don't do a soil test. And also because I, yeah. Um, there's a question oh, from Emily. Yes. For over the cardboard, does it matter what kind of wood chips, wood pine work? Any tips on sourcing wood chips? Yeah, I always get where I can from the town. Our, our local DPW um, is a repository for people dropping off chips. And then once a year, we get several loads of them. Um, and I, they're mixed, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Compost is the better. More compost is the better. We were spreading wood chips yesterday and just, you know, massive heat waves coming out of it. Um, we had gotten those chips back in November, I think, or December. Um, oh, so they were they're really breaking down. That's really nice if you can get broken down ones. There's a place called Chip Drop, which we signed up for, and they pretty much every week for about three months, they said, sorry, we don't have any this week. You want to renew? And I always renew, and then I... <laughs> Still never have got any from them, but we get them from our town DPW. So I don't know otherwise. You can ask people, keep your eyes open, get a chipper. Um, yeah. We've stopped crews on the street before and we have asked them. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes they stop and sometimes they don't. A few times off. they have stopped. Yeah. I find six pack of beer is a is very good. Oh, yes. I, I, I forget that. I was actually on the road the other day and they were working on the trees and I, I stopped for a minute. I was going to talk to the guy and he walked the other way. 
<laughs> so anyway, we do a lot of smell tests, and I, I, do, I, I, if I were to test everything, I, I don't ever do the fruit because we always take such good care of it. I, we did do a, we did test our soil last year in our blueberry patch, which you all will see when we built the hill, um, which we have cardboarded and chipped successively for several years in a row. And the organic guy was 17 on that um, when we last checked on it. So this year we did buy a t um, 22 tons, 22 tons, right? Of rock dust and spread it all over the farm. So we have that on our all of our berries. And some carbonatite, which is a, also a mined um, a product from Ontario, a region where they used to have the ocean, believe it or not. But, um, it's really high in calcium and a lot of good stuff. And then green sand was another thing that we bought last year and put down. So um, anyway, that's our, our, our uh, you, I would encourage you to potentially do a soil test and probably if you're in New England, you probably don't have enough calcium. And that's probably a big thing. So some source of calcium, you have some um, carbonatite is a great source of it. Uh, uh, calcium limestone, not, not magnesium lime. Um, not Lee lime, it comes from Lee mass, that's magnesium lime, you want calcium lime. Um, but it would be worthwhile if you're starting a patch to just get a sense of where you are and do some amending um, of appropriate things. And if you want calcium, you need boron and a few other things too. So check that out. Is it dolomite of dolomite lime? Is that dolomitic lime is the one that's more magnesium? Oh, so I shouldn't well, we don't want that. In, okay. in berry, you want calcium. Mm. <laughs> where, where do you get that? Well, they used to sell it um, from Hardwick Farmers, and um, they used to come out, and I don't know if they still do, but you can buy it in bags. Okay. You can also uh, join NOFA and buy things off the bulk order, but it's too late for this year. So mm -hmm. in January, if you're a member of NOFA, whatever, ask Connecticut or Rhode Island, and I suppose you have one in New Jersey, in uh, New Hampshire, too, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, tomorrow, I mean, pick up this Oh, hope to pick tomorrow, great. Um, you can order those kinds of things from the bulk order and then come pick them up. Here, if you live in town, because that's where a site here. Um, the chickens also do a lot of work under the small fruit, like I mentioned, and they're not only eating all of our earthworms, not all of them, I'm sure that they, they, they stay ahead of them, but <laughs> they're also eating grubs and bad things. So our chickens are out this time of year until about April 1st, um, and then they're out in um, mobile homes that they don't get back free again until October. Um, and then we have a generous foliar and drench regimen to build strong plants and avoid disease insects almost <coughs> entirely. So that's what I'm going to spend a little time on next. Um, so we have a special one for blueberries because we have found that our blueberries don't uh, do as well as we would like them to do. Um, our red raspberries are exceedingly good. Our black raspberries are hit and, hit and miss. Um, but these are all things that we've kind of added in the last two, three years to really bring up the quality of our berries. Our strawberries are doing really well at this point too. Um, so this is a rather um, generous protocol. And um, if you really want to have a lot of good fruit, and then you'll also find that, and you're, if you have a CSA or just yourself and you say, wow, this is the best fruit I've ever eaten, um, you know, because the sugar content um, gets complex sugar content gets really high on these things. So it's really high quality fruit um, and then lots of it too. So it's, it's worth the amount of money, any, any kind of, um, especially if you're testing it um, and, and seeing what it is that it's needing, you can really um, target your financial um, output for these kinds of things to make it work well. So as I said before, if you don't, you know, if you have if you are working in new land and your soil's not that up to speed, I would do a soil test and find out what you need in terms of rock minerals. But then this is, um, these more foliar applications are gonna be helpful to um, just, what they do is they stimulate the, um, the leaves of the plants to actually um, maximize their photosynthesis and send more explicit directions down to the roots uh, to talk to the biology that's down there about what they want in terms of minerals. And um, that'll really speed up your process and you'll get really good, um, good response. So these are, this is just mostly, I put all these in here just so that they'd be on here so that when, you have, when you're home with this, you can copy it off. But oh, first we're talking about a bud break and blossoming foliar and it, um, the 
consultants we work with at the Advancing Eagle Agriculture have put it, helped put it together a very specific protocol for our fruit. Um, until we started working with them, we had really hit or miss on all of our fruit. And then the last two, three years, like last year, we had tons and tons of apples. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, more than we could almost handle. Um, but we have just getting so much fruit now. Peaches are really good. Um, like I said, the red raspberries are always excellent. We don't have any of the, is it the <clears throat> drops of dinner? What is that? What's that? Drossel, Drosophila. Drosophila. <laughs> drops of dinner. I like that one better. Drosophila. No Drosophila. <laughs> None of the kind of bugs that, that come in and destroy the mummy berries that come on the berries and all that kind of stuff. We just don't get it. So this is, um, you know, there's a specific one for the bud break and blossoming time. And then a fruit set foliar tells for here, he's also helped us really figure out starting it on June 1st um, and doing it every three weeks for three times. These are all the stuff. Um, lots of different, these uh, rebound products are um, uh, reduced versions of these minerals, copper, iron, manganese, are oftentimes in the soil, but not accessible because you don't have, you know, the copious amounts of micro microbiology that you need. And these will help really get those things into those plants. Iron and manganese being major aspects that are often not available. Sea crop is going to have a lot of sea minerals in it. Photomag means photosynthesis magnification. Um, and that really helps us got some cobalt in it and a few other things that are really cool. Um, so a lot of good stuff in the micro 5000 is a um, knocking. I think the theory be, is behind, just like it with humans, you know, the plant <coughs> goes through sort of a attracting thing with the foliar stuff. And then all of a sudden it's a, there's a pregnancy period and the, and the chemical needs of the plant totally switch at that point. So that's why you really want to have a different kind of nutritional program. Thank you. I, was, uh, I should have said that, yes. Yeah. And we also do a seasonal soil drench, which means just basically spraying on the ground too. So there we have all these other things that put on the ground. Um, and then the fruit fill foliar, when it's in that period when it's putting a lot of um, uh, sugars into the plant, that's when you see the quarter of the hollow K, which is potassium. There's this period in any fruit's life where at first what it needs is calcium, calcium, calcium. And that is for the whole <clears throat> cell division period. And if you have too much potassium, which is often the case at that point, calcium and potassium can be antagonistic. And so the potassium will win out and you'll end up with um, aphids and problems and, and you know, weak, weak fruit. But so at the beginning, we need to make sure we have calcium. And as we get into that fruit fill period, we're going to make sure we have enough potassium to fill the fruit. Um, and then the post-harvest foliar, again, these are times, and this is true for your fruit trees also. You know, I think people will, sometimes will walk away from our trees and our berries when it's all done. It's like, okay, back to it next year, right? <laughs> it's really important the, because the time that, this is the pregnancy period, I guess we call it, Jack, right? When, um, when the plants are at rest, this is when they're starting to put on, I think it starts in, July, even or, or August, yeah, July, where they're really starting to put together what's going to happen next year. Or where the bugs are going to be and stuff like that. August, yeah. I think, August. Yeah, first. So that's why we need to really think about the post harvest treatment. And that's like getting ready <coughs> for next year because this these plants are having lots of children every year <coughs> in their lives, if we're lucky, if we've, if we've helped them throughout this process. So that's the post harvest foliar. What does what foliar mean? Oh, sorry, good, sorry, good question. Um, a foliar is we we have a backpack sprayer and it's a mister. Like um, you see the guys uptown and they when they're leaf blowing, it's the same thing. It's a misting thing. You're it's applying the nutrients to the leaf itself, basically, mm -hmm. and the leaf has a way of absorbing nutrients through little stomata, little holes on the leaf. So it's a different way than using a drench is using the roots to get nutrients to the plant, and a foliar is using the leaves. You get nutrients to the plant. And the other thing to remember when you are foliaring, foliaring is to do it um, whenever the sun's not out. So early in the morning or late in the evening, the mm -hmm. stomata are open. And if you if you do foliar feed during the day with these kinds of things, you'll burn the leaves. So it's very important. I'm not quite sure what foliar is. Well, it's putting it in a <coughs> in a in a mist blower and spraying it out onto the leaves. 
So is that kind of a uh, fertilization or something? Or? Yes, for, it's, it's fertility mixed with water. You know, very you know heavy. You mix these liquids with water, put them in a sprayer, and then you spray the <coughs> the leaves of the fruit plants. And would you do that with grapes, grape leaves as well? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, all, I mean, same, I mean, I think one of the things that one of the places where we noticed most the improvement in the quality, quantity also, but the quality of the grapes. I mean, we used to make grape juice back in the day. Yeah. I'd have to add a little honey to it because it just didn't taste very good. And now it's um, it's so ultra sweet that you want to cut that, that little water for it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so incredibly sweet. And the, the sweetness comes from all those minerals. Um, com and complex carbohydrates. So you're getting all those minerals into your system. Talk about resveratrol, you know, all the good things about res resveratrol and grapes that really you know, high high potency, <coughs> these, these crops and all the things that blueberries are so you know so good for. You really get in high potency when you when you basically we're maximizing this plant's ability. John Kemp, who's one of my heroes, would say that most um, most crops in the United States or most around the world, because we've really degraded all of our soils so terribly, mm -hmm. are operating at about 10 or 15 percent of their efficiency. And so what we're trying to do is to get up to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of efficiency. Harder with, with these perennials than it is with annuals. And you can get there quicker with annuals, but with perennials, you really have to be you know, thinking about them all year long and making sure that they have the good, um, you know, the good uh, fertility under the ground, that they, that they have the um, good mulching and um, all the minerals as needed and, and that there's some diversity there and perhaps, you know, chickens running through the orchard and all those kinds of things to add more diversity or cows, you know, grazing in the orchard. Um, and then making sure that you're, think about a tree that has, you know, a thousand pairs on it. We have a tree that does about a thousand pairs a year. And just think about what that takes to make that happen. So they really have to, those, we have to really mm -hmm. support the root system in reaching as far down as it can and having a really, um, you know, healthy, healthy microbial system, uh, uh, fungal system, the internet system of the, of the mycorrhizal fungi well established so that they can work with all of the other <coughs> microbes in the soil to bring all those things up to the to the leaves. And Julie, that company, A A E A, what was that again? Agro Advancing Eco Agriculture. Okay. Yeah. John Kemp is the principal oh, founder of that company. company. Okay. Yeah. He's, a, he's yeah. a really a, he's got some great YouTube so 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 I think. He is. He said um, his his goal is to have regenerative ag systems be the be mainstream agriculture by 2040. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is pretty cool. It's like you guys have a goal like that, right? <laughs> we don't have much time left. <laughs> and then I just, I'll just click through this quickly, but because we wanted to, I was, we're working with a, a consultant from AEA. And we said we would like our blueberries to do better. And he said, okay, we're going to do a special system for the blueberries. So this is all uh, blood break, fruit set, same thing, seasonal soil, ridge, fruit fill, post harvest foliar, all the same. Same kind of things, only a slightly different mix of, of, um, of you know. Uh, I'm trying to figure, help, trying to figure out how you're going. Oh, oh sorry, we're <laughs> post harvest foliar right now. Okay. Yeah, are you there? Yep. Yeah. Well, if someone it. doesn't have like a foliar sprayer, would you recommend doing something that's I would a foliar you, in a watering can? You can or do a watering can. A it depends on how many things you have. Or you yeah. can do a little backpack sprayer where you can pump them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little backpack there with a with a lever you can pump and carry it around pretty easily. Or it's if like it's small enough, you can use seventy bucks for, for that. That was spray. You can use oh, a spray yeah. can. You can spray. do a, like a you know spritzer. Um, it's I mean if you only have five or six bushes, a spritzer would work. Yeah, as long as you do it in the evening or early morning. Mm -hmm. So that's a good idea. Um, yeah, so we're going to probably go outside right now, but okay. I am. Do you do you folks online have any questions right now? Because we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye to you, and then we're going to um we're gonna tape this, and then and then you'll get it out in a couple of days, right? Yeah. Producer, <laughs> producer, yeah. Anybody have any questions online? Let's see. <laughs> Questions.
I think we're good. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you guys. We'll, have to, we'll hope to see you all in person one of these days. <laughs> Great. All right. So there's a bathroom.